Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Caribbean ICT Technical Forum. President of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, Honorable Melford Nicholas, other distinguished ministers of government from the Caribbean CTU member states, Chair of the Executive Council, other distinguished members of the Executive Council, permanent secretaries, chief technical advisors, senior government officials, Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, members of the diplomatic corps, heads of international organizations, sponsors, members of the media, and all, and all our online participants, welcome again. On behalf of the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, Mr. Rodney Taylor, I wish to extend a warm welcome to all our participants support across the Caribbean and to, to our ICT forum as we focus today on the team regional imperatives for accelerating the digital transformation post COVID-19. The CTU recognizes that sharing this and celebrating the outcomes of our efforts at the national and regional levels will serve as a key impetus for collective movement towards a single ICT space and ultimately economies and societies that can realize the true benefits of digital transformation in our region. Most critical or most critical government platforms have become, have become even more apparent to us and moving critical government plat platforms online has become even more apparent to us. We continue to experience great economic and social challenges and the need to conduct certain critical transactions and activities online. Whether it's a country initiative, such as the TTPAS, Disease Surveillance Health Information Management, uh, a center administration, personal management, uh, or geofencing opportunities, or regional initiatives, such as the CARICOM ED Travel Form, or the Apex Court Management System that facilitates the development of regional, a regional-wide a region ecosystem for court services and innovation and innovative support to sustain our very highly, our very high availability support for our regional club environment. All these. Um, pieces of infrastructure are very key to us today. So meeting, meeting today in the midst of a COVID pandemic demonstrates that online transactions have become a lifeline for us today. So today we'll explore and we'll interact and we'll have some discussions through a number of country and regional presentations. The practical solutions we need that will enable us to deliver the essential services to our citizens. So again, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to the CTU's ICT Technical Forum. So first off, I would also like to welcome my panel and I would, uh, we would want to get straight into our interactions today. And we would, I would like to invite my first presenter, Mr. Ian Withers. He is a radiographer um, and he's going to be presenting on the issue of disease surveillance, health information management, Center Administration, Personal Management, Electronic Interface, Sharp. So I welcome Mr. Witters to present. Uh, your, your audio is off. Mic is off. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, protocol having been observed at the start of this session, I'd like to get straight into the application, the shape application. Good morning, everyone. Once again, SHAPE, by its acronym, stands for Disease Surveillance Health Information Management Center Administration, Personnel Management and Electronic Interfacing. Uh, your first question is, uh, or I should think, would be, what exactly is SHAPE? And I like to see SHAPE as a tool, a system, and a way of thinking. When I first started, this application, and certainly we are at a time when we are severely challenged. And Niels Bohr is quoted to have said that every great and deep difficulty bears in itself its own solution and forces us 
to change our thinking in order to find it. And certainly that is where we are at this, in this pandemic. At the start of this application, uh, anecdotally, I, I remember that I came from a village and certainly in the village, we had a way of communicating and exchanging information. The story is that of my grandfather is that he was a very friendly guy. He was friendly with the neighbor next door, a neighbor at the top of the avenue, and neighbors further up. And my grandmother cooked for the children next door, and a cousin lived opposite. And we exchanged things, salt, sugar. And then, as my second uh, image shows you, uh, I moved to the, the terraces and the developments and built a bigger place. And I, I wasn't very friendly with my neighbor next door. And I knew people kind of by passing and by their car, but we weren't linked. And I found when I started at this development of this application is that we built our things similarly, or our software, we built it. We built huge silos and we were great at collecting data but somehow we never broke into these silos. We never built bridges to other silos. And so we had houses of data that we ne never really used effectively. And so I started to think that in order to do things well in this pandemic, we needed to shape our way of thinking. We needed to shape it differently. And so, came the system shape. And this is just a brief overview. There are a lot of other connections to shape, but the area that you can see in blue here really represents the core of the shape application where we have surveillance, the approved accommodations, polyclinics and testing, isolating centers, and all linked, whether it's by data sets or by APIs or other connections to things like the Electoral and Boundaries Commission, which is our authentic data set of citizens and residents, whether it is our immigration data set, which connected to shape via an API, which is our authentic data set of persons coming into Barbados. And then out of, you can see the other connections to shape in general, where you see here the Barbados Tourism Product Authority, public and private laboratories, and even our own solution for geofencing. All of these things are connecting using the village mindset, but with modern technologies to allow us to share and exchange information. And as I say that, uh, it brings me clearly on to shape the tool in itself. Uh, what does it actually do? We have already, we already have various processes in place. We have years of uh, ways of doing things and shape the tool reinforces these established processes. It standardizes and increases efficiency in the data capture. As you could imagine, we have, we all have well-tested, tried and true paper-based systems. And what this COVID experience has taught us certainly is that while we need backups, certainly we cannot handle the, the pace at which data is coming into it just using our paper-based systems. We now have a, a tool that facilitates greater information exchange. It regulates the access and monitors activity because of course, as we move to the more digital environment, we need to understand what is happening behind the scenes. And certainly we need to control who has access to the information. And the other things that you can see as well, it allows us to monitor trends, generate reports, enhances collaboration. And because SHAPE the, the tool is a modular build. It then offers us and creates opportunities for additional input and output. So having made that brief overview of shape, the vision for 
shape the way of thinking, shape the system and the tool, I'd like to show you some of the key things with, about the application itself. The application is built with um, responsive technology, so works on any web-enabled browser, and it sizes well whether it is on your, your desktop, laptop, or your mobile phone. There are key things about the application that I referred to before. So we have data sets that are if you like, embedded in the application, the ICD-10 data sets, which are approximately just over 12,000 records, list of registered professions, educational institution, list of vaccinators, radiological investigations. It is, it seeks to include, and then those things that are not embedded in the application we can exchange information via various connections. So we have a national list of doctors, the approved accommodations that I referred to earlier, connections with BIMSAFE, immigration laboratories, and our own Electoral and Boundaries Commission. Just to give you an idea of its usage, there are currently 59 testing centers that have access to shape, 121 vaccination centers users over 1200 and you can see from the information i've laid before you the public rapid test certificates it has issued 23,000 260,000 pcr test certificates and through its relationships we have issued with a european authority we issue now sealed vaccination certificates 22,000 that can be used and and uh, throughout Europe and our own, we, I, and we have our own methods of, if you like, validating our own PCR certificates as well. And the system has already done more, more than 129,000 vaccination first doses. And we have recorded just over 90,000 people who are fully vaccinated. As I mentioned before, SHIP is modular and we have these eight or 10 modules that you can see before you and, and is growing as demand because of the development. It's an agile development cycle that, that I've used for, uh, for building the shape application. So we respond to changes as they are made. Just to give you a quick look at some of the things within shape as well, um, you can see that there are maps and where we are currently heading, um, Barbados has already um, mapped the entire country and um, through the land and surveys department. And part of the goal as we move forward is to integrate these. So we can drill right down to the very house and it allows us to look at clusters. It looks, uh, and we can almost trace paths of disease. And that's where shape is headed. In addition to those, those maps, which would be like heat maps, we can see the approved accommodations already within shape as well. And we can drill right down. So this assists, assists us with our geofencing solution. And certainly I'll be interested to hear from, from my, my brother in Antigua about all the work that they're doing there as well, because they, this is the Caribbean telecommunication. We're doing things, and if we are going to be the, the power that we can be in the world, we have to, again, take that village mindset and, and share it within the region so that we can leverage on the strengths of each other. SHAPE has, as well, other interactions with it, and, and you would have heard me talk about the opportunities, uh, additional output opportunities. When coming into Barbados, you can currently upload your PCR and vaccination certificates. And SHAPE, once those are approved or denied, SHAPE will then issue a, a letter to the individual informing, informing them of their status. And you can see how this is kind of captured here in the basic Im immigration module and here is the end result uh, of that, one of the outputs of the SHAPE application. Additionally, this is a quick look at the sealed certificates. With, with a simple button click, 
we can issue the PCR certificate, which has its own barcode at the bottom. And here is a look at our vaccination certificate, which has a QR code in the top, which allows us to have that certification um, internationally throughout Europe. And certainly at the bottom for our local events and other things that are in the pipeline, we can see the local barcode, which allows validation of the information on this certificate. And, and speaking of that, this is a quick look at that verification tool currently within shape, but can be supplied to any registered user via an API where they can. So you can imagine a hotel, you present your certificate with a barcode, the barcode is scanned and then returns the information on that certificate, validating that what you have presented is, is authentic. The thinking behind SHAPE was far reaching and, and within SHAPE that has its own health information management module. And this is a quick look at the review of systems, which someone being admitted to facilities, you can follow the standard procedure. And certainly when they're admitted to various, um, let's say facilities again, that and they're admitted to beds in those facilities, this note. So you have their electronic health record, which when the clinician gets to the bed, it can pop up and tell you the current status of that individual. And you can also record the standard things that you would expect, the vitals, you can request radiological examinations. You can even request the diet for that individual and that information can then be processed uh, at the kitchen and deliver to the bed what is actually required or to the person what is actually required. Um, obviously, if you are in decision-making processes, you would need some kind of reports coming out of the system. And this one gives you a quick um, do comparison of the vaccination doses. As I said, we're over this 125,000 first doses, and this says that nine, over 98,000 by now persons have received their second doses. And this gives you a running total of your information and you can search it by anything. So you can have what's your running total for the day. Shape issues numerous kinds of reports. And here we're looking at the age range and gender in the PCR testing. One of the important things for us coming out of this whole COVID experience, of course, can we tell at any point? So these two graphs give uh, the positivity rate, if you like, and the seven day rolling average. So at any point you can see the trends. How are we trending at the moment? And this takes you right up to the, the current analysis. Where are we just below um, a level of six of the positivity rate? And the graph at the bottom, um, we thought it was important because not only are we serving our, our residents, our citizens and residents, but we have to understand how quickly we are returning information that is results to our citizens and residents and our, our visitors. And so the bottom graph gives an idea of the latency, how long, and then we can then begin to infer if there are challenges at our testing facilities or our laboratories, what those challenges are, and we can take the necessary steps. To, to sort it out. SHAPE, this shows quickly our hotline status because SHAPE has collected uh, probably over 26,000 hotline calls and has actioned them. And this gives an idea of the vaccinations by parish, telling us where we are and where we need to redirect our energies. So, what has been the shape experience? What have been the lessons learned having built this application? I think we realize that we need greater standardization of our technology infrastructure. Why do I say that? We have numerous 
uh, between 10 and 12 polyclinics situated around the island. Some of them have very good connectivity, some have medium connectivity, some may be challenged. And we need to ensure that it is the same across the board so that we can access information with the same speed and deliver service when we use the technology at the same rate. COVID has challenged us because it, the changes have come so quickly that we haven't had time as soon as we write one process or procedure challenges are coming and demand that we change or make alterations to that. We have to become better at documenting our processes and our, our procedures so that following COVID, we, we have systems in place that we can begin to look at other things that may happen and certainly build our structures and our technology to, to prepare for these things, which brings me onto the third experience, the third, the third lesson learned, that we have to prepare. Our region was probably a few months behind what was happening globally, and we're beginning to see those things happen here now. We have had time to look at some of those lessons and prepare, and then based on what we have, we can prioritize, but we need to plan. And that final lesson that, that I think that I've learned with that, this application, that, that people are absolutely everything. We need to educate our, our workforce, our staff, our partners, so that we can build together. We need to care for our people in ways. This has challenged us and stretched our people so that our work hours have become much longer. And we need to put systems in place that we care because after COVID, we need to build anew, build things better, build things so that we can, again, be the strength to the world that this region can be. I'd like to close here by leaving this thought with you. And at this point, I'll tell you a little bit about myself as well. Maybe you were surprised to see radiographer. I, am, I work in oncology and that's where my link with healthcare, but we are more than we are initially defined. And that's what I'd like to say to all of us. Shape came from a need, and at a radiographer who had experience, who ran a software development company back in the late 90s, who is a judoka, who is a family person, we can do many things other than what we are defined as, and I'll use inverted commas there. We are approaching a new age of synthesis. Knowledge cannot be merely a degree or a skill. It demands a broader vision, capabilities in critical thinking and logical deduction without which we cannot have constructive progress. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to share uh, my passion, to share shape with you. Of course, I'm available if persons would like to have a, a deeper discussion on the SHAPE application. I'd like to extend thanks to Secretary General Rodney Taylor for inviting me to share at this forum. Our own Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Moore, Amor Motley for believing because it was her belief that saw SHAPE come through. Our own Dr. Annalie Babb for seeing the potential for the team of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and certainly to my family who have put up with me all these late nights. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. This, this was a really excellent presentation. Um, you know, I've, to be honest, I've never seen any, a solution like this before. Um, Ian, you, you actually 
uh, this is the uh, excellent demonstration of people processes and technologies all integrated and and um, you said something there uh, that you shape the concept of shape of or your, your thinking behind it partly is to share the village mindset across the Caribbean. And I think that is, that is those, those statements resound um, really uh, deeply with me and I, I'm sure with a lot of the, the participants online. Um, I also like the, the notion of the local solution and the, the, the local verification aspect of the barcode um, tools and as well as its, its, its relevance and its applicability at the international level. So you're thinking, you're thinking local, um, but you have the ability to scale globally and all those concepts and thoughts inside of your, your design and your architecture is, is to be essentially amazing. I just have one question at this point, um, and I don't know if we, we probably can feel questions. I'm not sure if we're capturing feedback, but I want to ask you this, Ian. Um, is shape, you know, and I guess you may have thought of it, is shape an, an early prototype for some sort of smart city solution? Or can you see shape evolving? I can see it, but I don't know if you have anything to say on that. I, that's, that's my impression. Certainly. Um, <laughs> you're picking my brain now, I'm <laughs> smiling, because that's where we have to, to head. And we have been, through COVID, we have been pushed quickly in this direction because we cannot serve it's the needs of our populace with archaic systems. And that's what COVID has shown us more than anything. And I think that we have to take this opportunity to learn and learn quickly. And we cannot no, any longer buy siloed products that, own, that don't connect to anything else and don't serve us. We have to start looking deeply within ourselves and within the region and build those things that we can connect. We have to connect, otherwise we'll be left in the dust. Yes, very excellent, excellent, um, you know. And uh, just before we move on, I, I just want to note a couple of things and I identify the modules that you, you demonstrated, citizens and residents, hotline, survey, surveillance, contact tracing, immigration appointments, PCR tests, rapid testing, vaccination, health information, bed management, administration, all those are current issues, current problems that we're looking for solutions. And they, 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 they don't have to be, um, you don't have to develop systems in silos, all right, or separate systems. You can integrate the process and integrate the technology once the architecture is well, well defined based on uh, uh, the concepts that are, and the, the, to address the particular problems. So I really like that and I appreciate that. I really appreciate this presentation and, and um, um, stay online. We probably will need to chat some more. Uh, I'm asking all my presenters to stay online. So we may probably you know, have to continue the discussion. So thanks a lot, um, Ian. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move on to the, the next presenter. Uh, uh, we have um, Daniel Knight with us. Daniel, are you hearing me? Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear right. me clearly? Yes, we are hearing you. All right. So I will start my presentation shortly. Sure. So we have Daniel Knight. Just let me give you a brief, a brief background on, on, on Daniel. Okay, Brandon, Daniel, can you start up your, queue up your presentation? Sure, okay. I will. Queue it up, yes, thank you, let's see, thanks. So Daniel, you can introduce yourself and, and give a brief, a brief background of yourself before Certainly. Um, first, let me just apologize for my video camera. It seems to be trying to um, give me some issues. Uh, so, in any case, I uh, will start the presentation. 
So just to um, give some context, I, my name is Daniel Knight. I am representing the Ministry of Information, Broadcasting, Telecommunications, and IT within the government of Antigua, and uh, I am the director of so my presentation today uh, will be geofencing, and um, this is really just one of the solutions that we have chosen to uh, identify and to roll out as it relates to the response to this ongoing health crisis. So the presentation will pretty much give an overview or synopsis of what we have done. Um, just let me know if you are seeing my screen and then I'll go into the presentation right away. Yes, we are seeing your screen, Daniel, but the audio, the audio is sounding a bit distant. All right, let me see if I can um, improve much better. that. Much better. Much better. Much better. Wonderful. So the presentation is not a long one. Um, just to find the presentation, I will give you a review about me. Enter. Uh, I'll go into the introduction of the concepts related to the geofencing uh, solution uh, uh, that we have so sought to introduce. I'll talk a bit about the ongoing health crisis. I think it's very familiar to all of us, uh, just to localize it to Antigua and Barbuda's context, and then to describe for you the technology intervention that we have used, or at least one of them in relation to the clean management portal, where we are able to do what is referred to as geofencing of home quarantine persons and persons who may be found in government quarantine, for example. And then, of course, the lessons learned. Um, this is a very critical thing in relation to any sort of initiative. We have to review, monitor, observe, and try to figure out what can we do better and what are insights that we have for other persons that they can glean from. So of course, my name, as mentioned, is Daniel Knight. I am the director of e-government within the Department of e-government. That is squarely placed within the Ministry of Information, Broadcasting, Telecommunications, and Information Technology, um, commonly known as MIBTIT. I am from the country of Antigua and Barbuda, and I've been working with the civil service, the central government, for about 18 years, uh, three of which I am now with the ministry, and I am hoping to serve them well in this capacity. So of course we have regional representatives here. So you'd already be familiar with Antigua and Barbuda, but just in the event that there are persons who are viewing this that may not be aware uh, where Antigua and Barbuda is, it's within the Caribbean, the uh, archipelago as we call it, right in the heart of the Caribbean. It's an independent Commonwealth nation with a parliamentary system and a population size of about 100,000. So not very big by some global standards. We also have our boast 365 beaches with our slogan, the beach is just the beginning. And so as a result, the main industry is tourism. And you can see right away as we go into the presentation, how deeply impacted we have been in relation to this ongoing crisis. It stopped the movement of persons to our shores and also stop the movement of persons from our shores. As a result of the movement, however, in the previous sort of dispensation of our existence, the first case, the first COVID case, entered into Antigua and Barbuda in March of 2020. So in setting the context of the ongoing health crisis, we pretty much joined the battle uh, in, in March of last year. It was then that the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment began the process in collaboration with various agencies, various ministries, and of course the cabinet of Antigua and Barbuda to lead the battle against the disease and the variants since then. My minister, Minister Melford Nicholas, the Honorable Minister for MIBTIT and also the president of this illustrious CTU, collaborated with the Minister of Health, the Honorable Marvin Joseph, to introduce a technology that would assist with the quarantine management and response to the health crisis. Because of course, as many of you may already identify in your own context, leading this particular battle required a lot of strategies, a lot of tactics, a lot of intervention, and a lot of investment, human, finance, and otherwise. So as part of that, 
technology was seen, and rightly so, as one of the great equalizers in this particular fight. So as a result, I was asked to evaluate several companies and the offerings that um, they would have had as to tools that we could use potentially to assist in managing this ongoing health crisis. So we settled on an offering from the Amber Technology Group, which is based in Jamaica, and we thought it necessary to partner with regional entities because, of course, as the presenter identified earlier, the more we strengthen our connections and the more we collaborate with each other, the better we will be in terms of meeting particular needs. Of note, the technology has been a key pillar in the fight against the spread of the COVID-19 virus and its variants. So I'll explain why in just a minute. So in terms of the technology intervention, this was seen as very critical even as the borders were beginning to open back up, because this saw the return of nationals to our country, our brothers and sisters coming back home because of, of course, at the time it was very much an uncertain situation and still much so the same today. Persons were very fearful, people were from their loved ones. The government intervened in order to ensure that we could have the safe return of, its, uh, of our nationals. But we also understood that the risk associated with that is that some persons may have posed additional uh, risk in terms of the possibility of spread and community spread by bringing or introducing the virus to our shores. We also recognized that there was a significant need to resume tourism activities because, of course, this is the lifeblood of the country. So the government settled on the use of contact tracing bracelets, which were powered by a quarantine management portal. So of note, we established a command center. So this uh, meant that we had a number of employees that were brought on, as well as a number of organizations that we collaborated with in order to ensure that we were able to monitor persons in their home quarantine 24 by seven. Now, this was critical, of course, because persons were not accustomed to stay in place for a prolonged period of time. And we knew that some persons may breach the quarantine requirements and the protocols of the quarantine because of the nature of human beings. Likewise, once persons are in home quarantine or if they found themselves in government quarantine, they were fitted with contact tracing bracelets, which aided in the tracing um, solution that we had identified. So it was a joint operation between the MIBTIT, the MOHWE, i.e. the Information and Ministry of Health. So within the portal, we were able to use geofences. We were also able to report temperatures. Um, so users would report their temperatures seamlessly to the command center and to the quarantine authority and the Ministry of Health. We were able to identify alerts if there were geofence geo violations or if there were temperature spikes as well as use variables to our benefit and as well generate statistical uh, reports. So just to give you uh, an overview of how the geofencing works, each device will be assigned an EMI number, which is a unique number specific to the, the device. So it's like an ID. So that means that it is linked specific to individual wearer we then track the details of that individual where via the portal, addressing the particular uh, demographic details, such as name, address, date of birth, passport number. And of course, the EMI number in, uh, in question that would have been assigned is already attached to that particular profile that we would have uh, created and onboarded. And then of course, finally, and all of these things are linked, the geofence will be set around your graphic is slated to um, occupy or reside. So if it's at home, then we would find the location on the map, uh, identify, as you see illustrated in the um, image, a circle around the particular location, and we would size it to the location. And so if the person leaves the geofence, then an alert will automatically be sent to the command center. And then, of course, other protocols would ensue. So typically, when setting the geofence, a number of details will be identified. And so we can then update those details as new information comes 
So this is just a mock-up of exactly how it would look in terms of the portal to the user and what will then be assigned to them in relation to the information. We recognize through the technology implementation that it was not just about the technology. We had to uh, institute collaborative technology um, techniques, sorry, also protocols with the contact tracing team, providing them with the data that we observed within the command center to them. There was also a special attachment of the police force for those persons who violated the, the um, due offense. And whenever the alerts were identified, we would then contact um, that special attachment um, so that they can then secure the individual, return them to their um, home quarantine or in violation of particular matters, they may be sent to the government quarantine. The emergency medical team was also a part of the implementation and they were very instrumental in terms of first responses and also augmenting the existing uh, command center team made up of persons who are not necessarily health uh, practitioners or officials, but were able to learn and glean in relation to the protocols to really have a uh, strong and solid intervention. Likewise, uh, we would have collaborated, and I wish to thank the members of the Port Health in relation to the deployment of the technology, both at the ports of entry, uh, primarily at the um, airport, along with the airport authority, who really facilitated and assisted us in securing the right space and also the right processes in order to get persons outfitted with the contact tracing bracelets, and also for us to then do the geofencing that was required to help in the fight to save the population. So what are some of the key lessons learned? In, real, in reality, and echoing some of the sentiments uh, made by my colleague, hardware is just as critical as software in information system implementations. Strong infrastructure is always the key. We would have done a lot of um, spending, a lot of good investment into um, PCs at the command center, telephones, increasing and improving the bandwidth quality and the network quality, outfitting the networks and connecting them uh, through the various uh, switches and routing technology. We would have had the laptops and other key infrastructure, desks, um, sanitation, PPEs, all of those different things. We realized we'll come together in order to make implementation the most effective. Likewise, another lesson that cannot be overstated is the cross-agency collaboration and communication. It is par paramount to the success of any solution or intervention. Likewise, in relation to that same point, we realize that we must lead with the solution and not the technology. Because the technology is an enabler, an equalizer, and it really means that it can ha have a very far-reaching effect but we must understand what the particular requirements are. And in this case, it would have been a health response in order to tailor and fit the specific te technology solutions to meet the needs of our clients, our colleagues, and our brothers. And then, of, of course, finally, we learned from the experiences and we built on them. It wasn't an easy process. Um, there were challenges in the beginning, but of course, through it all, and through the discussions and the meetings and the interventions, we, we, we were able to move forward and to have success in relation to the geofencing initiative. So I open the floor then to any questions, and I want to thank uh, my mayor for his leadership on the matter, to the PM, uh, the Honorable Gaston Brown, and his cabinet in relation to the leadership they have shown throughout the, the, the crisis. Of course, singling out the Honorable um, Marwin Joseph, the Minister of Health, as all of these uh, individuals have, have charted the course forward in relation to intervening. And I thank the CTU for the opportunity to present, and I yield to, to you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you very much, Daniel. Really, again, a very exciting presentation that speaks to creativity, coming up with creative solutions, that that uh, and I like the less the lessons learned and and the whole notion of cross agency collaboration and you you indicated that is paramount so a lot of thought went into it a lot of discussions and collaborations 
coming up with the solution. And I think that that is a that is really excellent um, to note. I just have one question, Daniel. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions from the, the, the wider panel, the wider panel, or even the, 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 the audience as well. But my question to you, Daniel, would be, um, are there any opportunities to scale the geofencing technologies to support other use cases? Um, it appears to me that there's a lot of potential to scale even beyond the, the current use case. Uh, you know. So the bracelets are tied into a monitoring system and, and all of that and sending alerts, you know, those are really excellent tools. I don't know if you have any, any suggestions or, or comments on that, Daniel. Certainly, um, we, we recognize that while we are fighting um, this ongoing- um, Daniel, your audio is just dipping a bit. I don't know if you could. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me now? A little better, yes. Yes. Go ahead. I'm hearing you. Yes. Unfortunately, the bandwidth tends to, okay. to challenge us. Yes. So I was saying that um, the truth is we recognize that at some point we will get to the end of this fight, and at least we are hopeful. And so we have already begun to um, think about how to provision for the technology and even apply it to other scenarios um, going forward. Um, in similar fashion, there are so many uh, areas that we have understood particular uh, applicability. First of all, the command center concept is something that we would have deployed very quickly, and it's something that we will be using going forward in relation to uh, other technology implementations, such as uh, the deployment of CCTV cameras, uh, surveillance networks, uh, in relation to the Internet of Things, as we move forward on some of these concepts, we would have to have a similar approach. Um, likewise, in terms of um, network operating centers um, that will be monitoring activity levels, applications in terms of cyber security and cyber threats. So um, we see extensions in relation to that. In terms of the devices themselves, we've already identified potential links to, for example, persons with Alzheimer's and uh, assisting persons um, living locally to monitor uh, individuals, juvenile delinquents, um, perhaps monitoring persons um, who may require to do so in specific instances, um, prisoners on work, uh, outputs, and so forth. So uh, there are a number of potential applicable scenarios that we have looked at, and we recognize that as we get to the end of this crisis, hopefully, we then will be able to use the technology in similar fashion for other applications. Yes, that, that is excellent. I mean, and you can go on and on and on. <laughs> I mean, the initial solution, there are so many, so many other options and, and potential to scale the solution. So that's really good. And, and hearing, hearing similar trends coming out from all our presenters um, that, you know, we are creating and developing indigenous solutions but there is always scale in mind. We're thinking, we're thinking regional, we're thinking local, regional, and, and global as well, and in our design and in our architecture. And those are important considerations for the wider persons listening and, and who may be considering um, similar, developing similar, similar solutions. And again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can, we, I'm sure our, you would probably take note of our, our presenters, their email addresses, and, and get in contact with them, have a chat. Uh, you know, and uh, there may be opportunities to to utilize their solutions in your in your respective domains. So that that is a really excellent. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Daniel. Excellent presentation. So we will move on to our next presenter, and our next presenter would be uh, Mr. Shuwin Ragunanan from IGOF TT. Uh, Mr. Shuwin Ragunanan is the deputy CEO of IGOF TT. Uh, Trinidad Tobago. He is presently um, acting CEO, deputy CEO, and he has an extensive career in IT, in IT that spans almost 20 years, uh, both in the private and public sector, and he would have held positions in um, ICT engineering, project management, business development, ICT infrastructure solutions, and service management and support. And Sherwin is going to speak to us about the TT Travel Pass this morning. So over to you, Sherwin. Uh, a bit, yes. Thanks very much, Junior, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak here at this forum. 
Um, you hear me clearly, or do I need to speak up? We hear you quite clear. Very All clear, right, very clear. Much. All right, so let me just get the presentation started. Right. Presentation is in good view. Yes, it is. All right, yeah. great. Great. So when I was asked to speak here, I was asked to give a, a, country represent, um, a country presentation on this solution. And I think for any experience, an experience is best told through stories. So if we were to go back, and, and I know a lot of the, the members and, and um, previous speakers would have um, attested to this. If we go back two years, we would all know that we were in a very different space in terms of the way that we did business, the way that we learned in terms of schooling, the way that we um, interfaced and interacted in the office, the way in which we socialized. And here we are, after the events of COVID-19, facing this global pandemic of which the Caribbean was not left unscathed, we, all, we have to adapt. And in adapting, it meant that we needed to do a lot more things very differently than what we would have done before. And Trinidad and Tobago, in keeping with um, all the protocols prescribed by the health organizations for health and safety and for ensuring that you know, we quickly recover from this, we would have taken various measures. So our first restriction would have started in March 2020, where there was almost a full lockdown of the, in fact, there was a full lockdown of the, of the country and international travel actually ceased for several months. Thereafter, it would have regained some, um, some amount of, of external trans, um, travel, but via an exemption only um, situation. So that being said, we would have had incoming flights only for persons who would have been given specific exemptions to enter into the country. And there was a solution that IGovTT as a national IT company and the implementation arm of the ICT ministry, now the Ministry of Digital Transformation, um, we would have assisted with the, the Ministry of National Security in having that solution up. But here we are in 2021, and we recognize that this has fast become a way of life. And we need to get things moving in what everybody is now calling the new normal. So that being said, we started opening up the, the, travel, the, the travel channels, particularly from the air bridge to allow more persons in. And so that resulted in having a, a larger influx of persons coming into the country and still being able to manage and monitor um, the, the incumbent individuals and so that we can manage the threat associated with the COVID-19 uh, virus. So what were some of the impacts? I mean, I spoke briefly about them. We had changes to the way that employment was done, the workforce, IGovTT in particular, we've moved to a remote force, a remote workforce environment where on a daily basis, up between 85 and 90% of our staff actually working from home. This, did, this also changed the way in which we did business and the economic impact. We saw that a lot more um, businesses and companies started moving and transitioning their, their solutions and services onto online platforms. And from that, we started seeing uh, increase in um, revenue streams coming from the digital channels. But the focus of this presentation is how this um, COVID-19 internationally impacted on our citizens. Because we had students, we had expats, we had travelers who were stranded at a point in time in these uh, foreign territories, dying to get back home. We had businessmen who also needed to conduct their business, some of which could not be done online and needed to be in person. And for that, we needed to expand the way in which we 
we facilitated these things and made that available and possible. So the Treaty Travel Pass is, the, is that online portal to help us manage incoming travelers while maintaining an observation of the local health ordinance for COVID-19. So it meant now that we started taking in persons in flux, full flights coming into the country while still being able to um, assess and ensure that travelers were either vaccinated, fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated. And when they came, if they were going into state quarantine, if they were going into um, state sanctioned quarantine, or whether they would be released to, uh, to go into their domestic residences. So the provision of an electronic window was obviously the best mechanism to make this happen. The way of the paper would not be able to reach all the persons and all the parties across the globe. Plus, because of the way in which the COVID um, virus is, is manifested and interacts with persons, we want to make sure that the incoming travelers have uh, submitted PCR test so that we could gain, gauge the status of whether they are infected or uninfected or, or not in, infected and how they would be accepted into the country. So phase one started with our AirBridge and it was primarily done um, through the Caribbean airline partnership, Caribbean airline being uh, the local airline. Where we are right now is expanding that into seaports as well as to other airlines that may be coming in. So the objective was to have a shared platform across all these different stakeholders. So Ministry of Health through their Port Health um, unit, Ministry of National Security with, through the Immigration Unit, Ministry of Works and Transport for Airports Authority and other ports, the various airlines, as well as the hoteliers. As I mentioned before, we, there are state um, quarantine uh, locations as well as state sanction, which would have come back into the availability of rooms should persons uh, be necessary to quarantine. Um, and that needed to be managed as well and, and, cut, and classified and categorized, right? Because we expected an influx, a large influx of uh, requests coming in, workflows needed to be put in place so that the approvals are as far as possible automated. So it needed to be easy for the traveler to submit their documents, to get their approvals, easy for the airlines to access those manifests, and identify who is going where for airport authority as well, immigration and port health, and as well as um, for how they are then manage going forward and the reporting in the national scheme of things in, when it comes to uh, reporting uh, around the COVID-19 situation. So when iGovTT was engaged, we immediately went into project management mode and started to assess within the three different um, parts of the triangle what is available to us, what we knew, and what we needed to find out. So the cost was well-defined. Um, the previous speaker spoke about the Amber Group out of Jamaica being a, a major uh, facilitator for their solution. And we also um, engaged with the Amber Group similarly, right? The scope, well, let me move to the time. From when the, we were engaged together with all the other stakeholders, we were given a three and a half week timeline to have this solution in place. Now, anybody who would have gone through any public sector ICT deployment knows that even for the smallest of things, three and a half weeks is a very, very tight timeline to, to manage. And because of the different persons involved in terms of the myriad of, of stakeholders, and the, the changes that occur almost on a daily basis as, as it relates to how um, the COVID-19 situation is managed by the various authorities. While at a high level, we understood what the objectives were, as we started to drill down into the details, it started to reveal a lot more dynamic situations. For example, we, we may have travelers coming from countries who may not be able to establish an English PCR test, how do we accept that? Persons who would be using different tablet devices versus desktop devices, the formats in which they would be able to upload certain documents, 
the availability of, of, of them to provide certain information onto the platform and their general skill set in being able to maneuver the technology and how to make those things easier. So we found ourselves with a lot of questions. And as we proceeded along this three and a half week journey, we had to identify issues, very quickly come to conclusions and move ahead. So some of the challenges that we face. With any project, the, the larger the stakeholders, the larger the number of stakeholders, it's proportional to the, uh, to the number of interests that you have, the competing priorities, and the, uh, the increased risk or the increased um, probability of issues and conflict, right? Because of each one of these persons having different um, responsibilities in their normal handling of travelers, when it came to the system, which is a brand new system that they are not going to introduce, some of the roles and the responsibilities became unclear for who would be doing what. Their levels of access, the levels of, of, of um, support that they would need to bring to the table and the level of commitment. As I mentioned, not everything was known up front, and this made it very uh, challenging as well. Understanding as well that this is a, this was always going to be a very highly visible project. It meant that we had to be very careful with what we went forward with. Failure did not really have a place in what we needed to do. And for anybody as well who would have done IT deployments in public sector, change management and the introduction of a new IT system is always a challenge. So how did we overcome some of these things? So as I mentioned, we went straight into project management mode. And as far as possible, try to put the framework and structures around how it is we're gonna manage this. So we established um, a base of the key stakeholders, provided regular touch points, regular meetings, um, regular feedback, constantly refining and updating the roles and responsibilities. So each person will very, very um, understanding of where their boundaries were around the different, um, the process, the processes that they owned in the travel pass system. Of course, we had to maintain regular status reports and escalations will come in almost on a daily basis. This project moved from, in a three week period, it moved from managing activities on a daily basis to managing activities in an hourly basis, right? And of course, because of that, the channels of communication had to be very open and very fluid and very um, dynamic. So telephony, WhatsApp, and all the different informal means of communication became very critical to this project success. Now, as with any IT project, governance is a key part, right? So under the technical committees, we had the solution group, we had a support group, we had to make sure that um, as public sector, we still managed and, and um, did everything in accordance with the public procurement uh, regulations. And of course, at the end of it, we're gonna have a solution that we still need to contract manage uh, for some time to come. So those were the technical aspects. Change management, which were taken up uh, within this project and also individually by each stakeholder um, was, was very key and was actually excised as, as activities on its own because we recognized the disruption that this was gonna cause. And of course, sitting above it, we had our executive steering committee. So some of the success factors that really made this come to life, communication. There was open and, and, and uh, fluid communication between all parties. There was the, the communication was not hierarchical, but more matrix type, so that we had um, the chief medical officer speaking to technical professional resources. We had ministers involved in making decisions and bringing it back to um, key stakeholders and, and it may even be a, a low level technical officer, persons who were doing process maps, people who were dealing with the contracting, right? Um, because of all those things and, and the way that it came together, commitment around the process and around the project was quickly gained. And that helped move things along very swiftly. Because we had the commitment, timely decisions were coming. So an escalation that took place at four o'clock this afternoon 
if it didn't have a decision this afternoon, had there was a decision that, that would have been made before 9 a.m. the following day. So there were very um, timely activities and actions in terms of moving this ahead. The change management, as I mentioned, was, was, um, was a key aspect and because it was excised and because we had the commitment, we saw people making a lot more moves towards actually adopting, buying in, playing with the system, observing errors, bringing it to the fore so that it could quickly um, be amended and adopted so that at the end of the day, the stakeholders had a robust platform. They were comfortable with what was being done. The solution persons were very, um, were very happy and pleased around the security aspects of it, as well as the citizens who needed to use it. They, they would have had an experience that was amenable and accommodating to them. And I think above all of it, all of these things were really possible because of a strong and consistent executive champion. And I don't think that a lot of people take stock of how important having that individual is. In this case, while we would have had all these different stakeholders, Ministry of Health, um, Port um, Airport Authority, Ministry of National Security, Immigration, et cetera, this was actually led by the office of the Prime Minister. Minister Stuart Young, who is a minister in the ministry, on the office of the prime minister, he was the executive champion. And he was able to bolster the support of his other ministers and of the chief officers in these other agencies to make sure that things happen. He was even so much on the ground in terms of making site visits on a daily basis, site visits sometime on the weekend, speaking to staff, speaking to general users of the system so that everybody was on was, was committed and driving towards getting this done and he as well was there as the executive champion clearing any roadblocks that would have been present so at the end of the day and this is just at a very high level in solution overview we had four pillars on which we stood and which under which the platform was launched so in the three weeks time that we had to do this there is no way that we would have been able to procure and deploy infrastructure uh, in the traditional means. So we had to look at cloud technology, right? It gave us a flexible, reliable, and scalable solution, um, the scalable infrastructure solution that was necessary to get this up. That being said, security maintained a, a paramount position in all the, dis all the technical discussions, right? We were capturing health information from individuals and other key sensitive information from citizens and travelers that would be coming in. So security was very paramount. Together with the, the, um, the in-house, and I'm saying in-house from the government perspective, the in-house resources, together with the contractor, we had to make sure that we had tight SLEs and that the contract management that was done for the implementation and also for the support was properly in place and well-managed. And at the end of the day, because, so in the solution group, uh, in, sorry, in the stakeholder group, everybody would have realized that um, the key stakeholder who which made up the probably 95% of the bulk is really the travelers. But to engage with every traveler and get their feedback and have them do testing, et cetera, would not have facilitated the timelines and would have been very impractical as well. So we had to set up some robust support mechanisms for, these, for the travelers and the persons that would be interfacing and interacting with the system so that their experience becomes um, becomes easier and it becomes facilitative rather than restrictive. So our, we in iGovTT, uh, the TT Connect group, which deals with citizen services, um, we, during the COVID situation, in fact, prior to the COVID situation, we would have launched our live chat service, live chat and chatbot services. So at the end of the day, um, on the Travel Pass site, should anybody encounter issues while there is an FAQ. We also had via the TT Connect channel, we had international and local numbers, tool free numbers that are available for travelers to call in should they have issues, as well as through the Gov chat facility for, uh, for travelers to interface with either a live agent or 
with the chatbot service to get the, the responsiveness that they need. Of course, at the end of the day, if they, if, they, if they don't have from chatbot side, if they didn't get the responses that they needed, they could have always logged a ticket and somebody from the TT Connect group would have gotten back to them. And this has worked out extremely well. The feedback that, that we receive because of this, uh, because of this arm of the support really lent itself to, to a good experience for persons using the travel pass and having to enter into the country. And so TT Travel Pass went live on the 17th of July. So we would have just hit the two month mark in terms of having the solution up and running. And thus far we've been able to process over 15,000 travelers. And this is only via the Airbridge, particularly on the Caribbean Airlines um, or the Caribbean Airlines carrier. So it does show and demonstrate how these digital platforms could really reach persons, be facilitative, and change the way in which we do business and accommodate our citizens and, and accommodate the way um, that we need to move forward so that we don't stymie ourselves, our economies, and how we move forward. All right. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shui. This is that was again another excellent presentation. And it's quite a lot, quite a lot that um, that happened within three and a half weeks. I just want to note a couple of things that you said that I think, you know, and again, each presentation brings up a different dimension of problem solving. I mean, you 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 focus a lot on defining the process from the start. So you didn't detail went through the process. Even before we started to talk about technology, we went into the process. Significant research went into the thinking. Um, scale was inherent in the design. Mm -hmm. Those are fundamental things. Um, a well-defined um, project plan and scope was established, and in the midst, and, and this all this happened in the midst of a crisis situation. We're talking about three and a half weeks, okay? Correct. All, all these things, proper methodologies were implemented. Well-defined risk assessment and critical assumptions were made. Change man, with change management in mind. Um, I just have one question for you, Shoin, uh, sure. to, to add to, to everything that you said. Couldn't find a question because you, you kind of the presentation was very complete. Um, but essentially, what linkages or integration points um, do you see the TT Travel Pass has um, with new evolving, new or evolving systems? Uh, I know the cloud technology, cloud technologies will leverage a lot and extensively. So um, I'm sure you may you would have thought about other integration points or uh, other evolving systems that eventually. The, the TT Pass, Travel Pass can probably evolve into or support other, other use cases. So, uh, and, and that's a part that, that we're still trying to get into because during this COVID-19 crisis, while TT Travel Pass was one of the solutions that would have come out, in several other ministries and agencies, they also started developing their systems and services. So for example, our um, Ministry of Health started putting a lot of trust into digitization of their vaccination system. So the integration into that um, solution would now also make it easier for persons who may be exiting and re-entering the country, seeing that they would have had now these digital records that we could validate against. So that's, those, are, those are some of the points, plus together um, with the seaports, bookings, et cetera, even in the airports as well, um, booking information, how we, take the information that would be submitted via passports to now integrate with the vaccination system so that it really becomes complete and it takes um, some of the burden and, and ownership from the customer and moves it now into the digital system. So there's, there's a level of confidence that the information that we're looking at and that we're processing, we could stand by it because it has been validated already and sits in a, in a digital database that is easy to access and look at it from an end-to-end -end process. So those are some of the points that, that we're looking at, and we're still evolving in those regards. Yeah, and I like what you said there. You said, actually, you're building a platform, not that after Correct. you're building a platform, it can scale, and you, have, you, you see, you have a vision, you have plans to integrate other use cases and have a, a, a growing platform ecosystem. Yep. Really good, really good, excellent presentation. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, Shirley. Um, at really this point, I would like to invite the Secretary General, uh, Rodney Taylor, to um, have some interventions at this point.
Thank you, SG. Yeah, thanks, Junior. And I want to thank the pres presenters who have gone before as well. Um, I joined a few minutes late because I was in the other forum that's running in parallel to this one, the regulators forum, focusing on how we can have a common regulatory framework within the um, within the CARICOM member states. So this forum in particular, the, the, the technical forum uh, came about, I had a chat with Ovin Harewood from Barbados, who's um, um, he, he's director of, I think, Digital Solutions with the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Smart Technology. And he said, you know, why don't we have a, a forum to collaborate with the, um, you know, the technical community throughout the region, in particular government. Um, and so I said, great idea, let's do it in our ICT week. So pleased that um, in many cases in short notice, and we all know that in COVID short notice is the order of the day. Um, you know, we've had my experience as well working in MIS, very short notice in terms of the welcome stamp application. Ian can testify to short notice as well in getting shape up. So that is sort of the new normal now to, to deliver very quickly in, in an agile in an agile manner. So I've, I've had experience in almost everything that's been presented here. In fact, I was, as you were speaking, I was digging for my TT travel pass. I couldn't find it because I, I travel with the, with the back. Okay. So I have this one is actually from Guyana. I have had St. Lucia. I've had, um, you know, I've had the first time experience of, of, of using the application from the customer end. Uh, one thing on the TT Travel Pass is the, um, I think it's actually a very, very good initiative that facilitates um, travel. Uh, and we, I know we have a presentation as well from CARICOM Impacts. The, the, there is sort of just in terms of the process side of it, um, the duplication with respect to the entry departure form. So Impacts will speak to the online EV form aspect uh, because that is still required. Um, for travelers coming into Trinidad and Tobago. And the other thing is that um, if I were to look at the process side and improvement, the airlines require you to actually present, and they will accept it on the phone, which is a good thing. Um, so you will have to present your travel pass, you present your negative PCR test as well to the airline, you also present to Port Health. So if I were to look at it from a more seamless perspective, it'd be good to have more integration at the level of the airline and port health so that you know if once documents are validated and passengers arrive it's a, a little faster and we know of course with COVID everybody's trying to be careful um, and so you can get pretty long wait times at the airport and then there isn't necessarily one set of protocols that apply across the region so in Barbados you are required to have a, a PCR test on arrival and you have to wait in quarantine until you get back those results. And Ian's um, system shape is key in that whole effort to manage those test results and get them back to the thing. So, um, so those are just my observations, firstly. But secondly, um, to what extent, uh, and then I'll pose this question to Ian, um, and I'm familiar with the shape application, but um, to, to what extent was indigenous talent involved in developing these applications and um, later on, just to give an overview, we have a presentation from Apex as well. Um, to what extent we had local developers involved, one, and then to what extent do you think these applications have scope outside of the national application or implementation? Uh, is this something you think that could take on legs beyond COVID and beyond Barbados, beyond Trinidad, uh, working in partnership with, with agencies such as CARICOM Impacts and CARPA to facilitate um, what we are trying to achieve, which is a, this travel bubble that allows us within the CARICOM single space, uh, CARICOM ICT single space, to move freely once you're within that space, of course, adhering to the public health um, protocols and stuff. So maybe I'll pose that to Ian, but I'll also pose it to um, Sherwin uh, and any other um, presenter who wants to discuss this whole issue of one, Indigenous talent development, and also application outside of the national uh, requirements. Our borders. Thank you, Jim. Good. Good morning, Ben Secretary General Taylor. Um, certainly, first to answer your your first question, um, Shape itself was uh, fully developed locally here in Barbados. Um, I am the the lead developer and the creator of the application, and then obviously with some 
in some areas that require other specialty, I, I have other team members on, on board. But your, your second question where, where it relates to the scope of the application, certainly, um, I'd like to say this, that when we build with a, a narrow view, as you know, we have limited capabilities. And SHAPE itself, while it was developed during COVID times, was never about COVID solely. I think in my first presentation I made to, to our prime minister here, where I, I showed the maps, uh, particularly of some areas where shut-ins could be visited, the initial thought was about our community visiting from our polyclinic system and home care. And then some other discussions that I have as we begin to look at the region in some remote areas, should the application be also offline and come back and sync to the parent application when people have collected the information. So the build of shape is, has been thinking initially be about Barbados, but it has been thinking about the region. And I'm so happy to see the travel pass and the stuff that's done in Antigua as well, because I am seeing the synergies and I, I believe that we can build together in the region and we can build and sell to the world because our applications can be and are as good. So I, I hope that answers where my thinking is uh, and the thoughts of where I, I see shape and our regional build headed. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Rodney, just uh, um, to jump off and I think Ian, Ian was spot on. The challenge we had in, in being able to use the, the local talent I guess was the time frames and the timelines. Because there wasn't any solution that was readily available, we really had to look to the market to see um, what was done. And across the region, as we reviewed, we recognized that the Amber Group out of Jamaica was doing a lot of work with, with many of the other Caribbean countries. So it was a natural fit. And because of the successes, it lent itself very easily to traversing that path. However, um, when it comes to the, the wider regional view, when we look at um, the Caribbean as a community, the, definitely because we also, we, in, I mean, through most of the presentations, many of the persons are utilizing the AMBA system, the AMBA solution or something very similar. The local health ordinances and the travel ordinances that are set in place for protection and, and regulation during this COVID-19 um, pandemic has by and large been very common across all the countries. So it lends itself very easily to adopting this um, uh, a common service or a common platform. It would also help in being able to share information from country to country so that persons who need to move from Antigua to um, Barbados or to Trinidad or to Jamaica, it makes it very easy because in, from that centralized database, you would easily be able to see what's taking place with each one with these travelers, making their experience as well a little bit better. So definitely there are ways, there, there are areas that, that we could um, improve on this. Thank you as well. I see Donovan is on and I know Donovan has a presentation later, so I'm not gonna necessarily put him on the spot, but I did. Um, speak to the issue of impacts and the need. So maybe Donovan, you will wait till your presentation comes up. But um, I am keen on seeing. Um, well, sorry, let me put on my video. Um, yeah, I'm keen on hearing, in particular, um, the application of the um, the online travel form uh, across across the region and the integration with that system to the applications like SHAPE and TT Travel Pass and how it can be made more seamless and more consistent across our CARICOM member states. You want me to respond there, Rodney? <laughs> well, if you are so minded. No, I, I mean, is the, I mean, we spoke about this yesterday um, in the regional travel bubble. I, I can pretty much repeat some of the same thing, but remember in terms of you talk about the shape, you talk about all the other applications. We need we need that one central 
you need that one central repository. Uh, once you get a repository to, to have where you have data integration, have that easy information access across the CARICOM member states. Once you have that, then it'd be easy to make things seamless because you're looking at travel simplification. You're making things not as difficult as they are now. That's, that's what the main, main, main focus is. On top of that, from the impacts perspective, you have to look, you have to maintain security. Border security is a must. Yes, you want to make travel easier, but you don't want the wrong person to get across your borders. And that's that's what we're looking at. I hope that is um, satisfactory, sir. Yeah, yeah, please, I'm pleased with that. And I think coming out of this, you probably should have a further technical discussion and, and maybe a, a strategy to how we can make, you know, make that happen. And yeah, we'd, be, we'd be here to support that, working in partnership with you. Correct. All right, thanks. Junior, back over to you, sorry. This yes, is, yes, thanks uh, a lot, um, SG. And uh, just, just to note, I mean, coming out from the interactions, they are very interesting. Uh, we're recognizing that um, we're all in a crisis and um, we all have to react and respond to the crisis at hand. And as, we, as, in, as individual states, we we have to find creative ways. I, I like what I'm sure instead and pointed out, I, and I observed that that the amber solution was re, was used, I think, as well with with, with, um, with Sharp, as well with um, TT Pass, um, as well I think with uh, with 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 Ian, with, with uh, the other solution as well coming out of um, the geofencing as well. So um, there is collaboration that's happening, uh, but I think uh, for us forums like these. For like these, uh, create the, the space for us to have these conversations, um, a little sort of in the open a bit more, and um, and there is clearly an opportunity for us to continue the, the, the discussions even on these specific projects moving forward. Um, there's there's a clear because they are all all related in one way or another, and we can probably continue that discussion. So this is a I think this is a good starting point for those discussions to to germinate and bear fruit and, and evolve, and we could probably have. Uh, a homogeneous solution at the end of the day that we can use across the region, um, taking input from all stakeholders and all parties that are you know, all involved. So that that is excellent. Um, I know we have um, we have about uh, about ten minutes again before we get into the break, um, and I just want to open the floor to any one of the any one of the, the panelists, um, even those who may not have um, presented as yet to give their input to share or if you have any questions or comments on the presentations that, that would have gone before because the idea is to have an interactive session. All right, and um, we, you know, we have we, uh, this, the first part of the session this morning focused on country specific solutions. And, and the, the second part of the session post the break will be focusing on regional solutions. But we all, we, we, we recognize that there, there's no difference essentially um, national solutions can evolve into regional solutions. Regional solutions are essentially national solutions. So, you know, the, the, the discussion is, is, you know, going across, is cross-cutting. Um, and so I just want to open the floor to, to comments and feedback, um, probably from one or two of the presenters that would come on after, um, post the break, um, the, talking about, you know, talking specifically to your regional solutions, but you may be you may feel inclined to speak to one of the, you know, comment on one of the solutions that you would have seen. Um, so I, I can put somebody on the spot. We have Richard Wall. I don't know if Richard would want to comment. And you know, sorry, just, just also to encourage the participants following on Google yes. that they can post the questions here as well, Mike. Yes. Yeah, I was following up on that. I, I don't, and we, we have so far I've been tracking, we haven't received any, but. Again, that is really important. The wider participating audience can post your questions online. Please do. We want to feel questions. We don't only want to have the discussion among ourselves, but we want to, the, the ideas for to, to share the information with the wider public and, and get your views and perspectives as well. So please feel free to post on any of the sessions that would have gone before and the ones that are to come. So Mr. Wall. Hi, good morning, everyone. Junior, can you uh, repeat the question? Please? Oh, no, no, I just, just wanted a general comment. I don't know if you, you were able to uh, observe any of the presentations. Yeah, before. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, the one point that I wanted to pick up on um, that uh, Mr. Taylor mentioned um, is the use of Caribbean nationals in the development of these solutions. I think that's an issue that has been near and dear to me. Um, uh, in Apex, we have uh, done exactly that. We've made a, an effort um, to use Caribbean nationals. And in the process, we discovered, um, and we know that this uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, a status inside the Caribbean. Um, our developers and software engineers, quality assurance experts, security specialists, um, they are the same as what you would get in, in the developing world. Uh, there is no longer distinction between um, what the skill sets for some of these individuals, um, what they would have that differentiates them from um, the developing world. We found uh, excellent expertise um, in the Caribbean and our base um, is uh, Caribbean uh, national developers software architects and things like that. So um, I know sometimes uh, there are issues in terms of timelines and things like that, um, but we have found um, significant uh, uh, skill set and um, talent in the Caribbean when it comes to, to, to the development. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that because I think, um, I think like Eon had mentioned, uh, we have the ability to uh, build great systems. I think systems that can uh, reach beyond the region and impact uh, the world. And sometimes that takes believing it and believing in the talent that we have here, um, using the talent that we have here and building Caribbean solutions that could impact the world. Yeah, that's, thank you, Richard, for that intervention. And, and that, that, I think that is an important point to note. Uh, the indigenous talent, and we, we actually seen it on display here today. And the SG spoke about it. And I think that is the whole notion of developing our skills. And, and I, I believe I'm a full believer in, in that, yeah, you know, charity, as we say, charity begins at home. And we, we need to really look inward before we look ex outside of our, our region to begin with. And um, so really, really excellent comments. Um, I want to feel any, any further comments from any one of the, the panelists. Feel free to, to add, or we don't have any questions on the wider topic as yet. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'll, just I, I want to, sure, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, just wanted to sort of piggyback on, on that comment because I think it's a very useful one. Uh, it's something that we we faced uh, locally in Antigua and Barbuda when trying to find solutions. We also looked internally, and we recognized that while the skills and the talent is there, um, there are two perhaps um, two gaps that exist. Um, perhaps the first is uh, in relation to how do we find these individuals in the first place. So sourcing the, the, the assets and the resources is a challenge because there's no single repository or location. Um, in Antigua, we have a, a concept called Silicon Dadly, where we have a number of technologists that come together in a sort of informal group. And so that was one of the sources that we chose. But in terms of a formal, let's say, um, industry listing or a known resource, that seems to be one of the challenges that I note um, locally, and I, I foresee perhaps is a similar concept throughout the region. The second is coordination, because oftentimes um, they're not formal companies or firms, they're individual developers, programmers, uh, DevOps engineers, um, quality assurance testers, and those types of things as individuals, because typically they may have their um, substantive duties. So coordinating work I think is also this terms of making sure we have all the right skill sets coming to bear, then produce this when required. And not just from the technology standpoint, but also from the business standpoint, in terms of business analysts, um, in terms of the inventory analysts for products, in terms of the solutions experts, the product specialists, even account managers, the business development side of things, 
to really ensure that we are pushing the product, the services to the right locations and the right persons, even as we build out. So I think those are the two things I would highlight, even as discuss. Yes, thanks a lot, um, Daniel. I, I heard most of what you said um, because your, your volume was sort of in and out. But um, again, yes, I think I, I just want to, to, to add to that as well. I know and draw parallels. I know we have uh, some of us, or most of us may be familiar with Carib now, that is the Caribbean Network Operators Group. And that was formed out of, you know, just building relationships between engineers um, across disciplines, throughout the region, in various sectors. And, um, you know, that has yielded significant food where, to the point where we have significant capacity in the region that is accessible and well coordinated, as you indicated. Um, and I think that 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 approach, um, that that model is can be replicated and 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 applied to even the software development side of it, uh, or the DevOps side of it. And so you know, like-minded um, engineers, application engineers, application architects, software developers coming together across the region, and and this could be a start of it. This group here, this core group, can be a, can can could kind of have that discussion continue along those lines, because it's important to be able to identify resources at, at short notice and, and you know, we have relationships with each other, but if we extend the board beyond the, our borders, and, and I know we are doing that, I think that is something that we can formalize and put structure in place to facilitate, it, you know, apart, quite apart from just the, the um, accessing resources, but also developing resources and building relationships and sharing ideas and stuff beyond projects. Uh, you know that would be that would be important. I saw. I think Ian, you. I saw you muted. If you have something to say, I think you. Yes. Sure. Yes, I, I wanted to jump in and and say kind of that um, uh, a way. I refer to that way of thinking again and say that oftentimes genius is revealed in the strangest of places, and we need to also break again our way of thinking. We need to have the repositories and we need to have the developers, but sometimes it is the way of thinking that, it, that moves outside of this traditional form that allows us to make that leap in development. And you know, we need to set up our spaces where discussions happen so that we can tap into this genius that does not exist in the traditional forums and then build on that. So that would be my comment to that, sir. That, that, that is, uh, I mean, you know, that, that is so excellent. I know, um, I recall a, a colleague of mine from, uh, from South Africa having a discussion with him years ago and he was telling me um, uh, it, the universities in, in, in India from where he, originally came from. Um, after, after college, after classes conclude, they would have um, just games and games would focus on maths and, and solving problems, critical thinking. And that would be their fun. They created a space where, you know, they, they, that was part of the socializing efforts. And um, I mean, it might be unique to them, but again, you know, we could create those learning spaces, as you said, um, you know, you know up, quite apart from school, and the, the academic side of it, and you, you come out of school, you get your certificates, so etc. But you create that environment for, I know we have a lot of, um, the, at some point, I know we had like Bright Park Foundation, we have a number of initiatives that would create uh, the opportunity for young developers, um, persons without experience to, to actually engage in software development, learn about the tools, learn about the, the craft. Um, but I think I think we can create the environment, and I think that that's what you're talking about here: learning spaces, creating that those environments uh, that are not in the traditional sense, um, but outside of the traditional sense. Um, creating it, making it fun, making it appealing to the to, to, to person who you know would otherwise may may not even be interested, because the talent, as you said, is your background is in ideology. Um, but again, you you. You have a, 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 a love and a passion for software development, and so your your background and your and your passion come find, find found a, found a place of confluence, and and um, you actually create you, 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 you be actually a lot more creative than persons who are just you know um, have one discipline. You have multiple skills, multiple disciplines, and they all converging into the providing solutions. And I think that we have a lot of creative people like that in the region. 
as we need to tap into. So that is excellent. Um, I don't know if SG, you have any more comments because we actually have one minute before, actually five minutes before we break. Um, uh, no, I'm I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we're we're fine to uh, go to break if you wanted to. Um, Great. Okay. Resume at uh, eleven, then uh, take on Great. the other so, presentations, and I hope that we can, uh, as I, as I said, keep these sessions interactive, and it's really a forum for sharing as well, and learning. Great. Okay. So, Junior, before we go to break, so, if, if I could just intervene as well, um, and share some of our experiences. So in 2019. Um, I got TT actually hosted its first hackathon event. And it was a little bit different from several other hackathons because um, the, the, the forum and the competition was based around creating practical government solutions. So it wasn't just about coding for coding sake or, or coding to show off your skills. It was really to get solutions that we could then employ. So we would have engaged with several ministries. We would have looked internally as well as some common solutions that we would like. And that formed the basis of the competition. And coming out from it, we actually had three solutions that we went forward and, start and did a lot more refinement and development during 2020 and would have launched um, in, tw in 2021 and the beginning of this year. So our e-appointment solution which is a common platform appointment solution that is being used by our attorney general's office, is being used um, in our TT Connect centers, is being, um, it was just recently deployed with um, CSME um, yesterday. And several other agencies that are using it, Ministry of Health as well was a candidate to use it as well um, for their vaccination appointments. Um, Employ TT, which is basically a government. Um, uh, Caribbean jobs portal, if you could think about it like that. And um, there was a, a TT commute, which would basically bring in all different forms of transport between um, ferry, bus, air, walk, cycling, et cetera, to get you from point A to point B. Um, those were some of the things that came out from it. And we went live with both the e-appointment um, and the employee TT platforms. And it really shows that as um, Daniel and Ian were saying, it really shows that the talent for local development today is so much better. And, and I think the tools that are available and the DevOps platforms that are available is more conducive as well now for rapid development and maintenance of those solutions as well moving forward. AngularJS, React, um, all these different tools, C++, .NET platforms, they are so um, commonplace now. And the learnings are, are made so much more available. I mean, many people could even learn coding and development looking at YouTube programs, right? I mean, you don't have to take formal schooling and you could develop that skill yourself. Website development, um, simple database creations, all these things are, are available to us. And I think if we make this space um, common and, and, and um, facilitative, we would start to see a lot of persons with these development, um, with, with, with the interests coming forward and bringing things to bear. I think one of the things though that we'll probably need to do is, um, and this is a challenge that we had coming out from the hackathon, we learned this. When you don't have that development um, standard or framework in place, you find yourself now being bombarded by different development technologies. So in one case, you might be dealing with um, Java development. In another space, you might be dealing with C++, C Sharp. And then now you now have to expand your capability base to manage and maintain each one of these things, as opposed to if you know, you're kind of streamlining around a particular development platform or development trust, which in a lot of cases we see in very, um, we see in a lot of similarities between them. So, you know, you could kind of um, manage how it is you get things in and do the development and, and really give people that forum. And many of the solutions that we develop in, um, in Trinidad, we see that there's common need. There is common need across the region. And, and I think if we have that uh, solution in place, Junior, like I said, maybe this is the, the core group to kick those things off and get it going. You know, I, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of success there. Yeah. yeah. Junior, sorry, one thing no. that actually just came to mind very quick, uh, quickly. Um, 
One of the other applications that I, I wish we had time to discuss, and maybe that's for another time, but the issuing of emergency passes in Barbados, um, that is something that we were able to leverage in a short, um, short time frame. Um, developed in-house at MIS, um, use um, Microsoft Power Business Intelligence as well to help automate the process. Um, but the whole need to get passes out, right? In, in the case where there was um, not a state of emergency, where, um, what do you call it? The <laughs> curfew, curfew. <laughs> in cases where governments had implemented curfews and you have to be off the road, but you still wanted to facilitate emergency workers or persons who had, you know, caregivers who were required to go and look after. And this is this, I think this is one of Barbados' success stories in the in, in standing up in a very short time frame because this thing was announced, I think, I don't remember what day, but you had maybe about 40 hours to at least try to get a solution in place where you obviously with thousands and thousands of, of requests, um, you didn't want people necessarily converging on a government office to get a physical pass. So we, the work, we worked a system out which would allow the issuing of emergency passes directly to the cell phone um, and then a system that allow police and law enforcement to validate that pass right so that to, to eliminate things like fraud and so on so I'm sure some of the other colleagues from this are on I hope they're on um, but and if there's some time and they want to speak on that later in the afternoon if we have some time it would be good but I think that is one of the success stories and um, we had talked about even in terms of digital identity uh, the need to have a database, say, for example, of emergency workers that, in, that could be stood up in the event. Because one of the challenges you had in issuing the passes is that how do you validate that, yes, this person is in fact a, a law enforcement officer or this person is a caregiver or their doctor and what's not. And that can be integrated into a digital identity system that, that you know, the state can determine um, whether you're an emergency worker or an essential worker. And that can be tied into a system that allows you to move within curfew period. All right, so I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Eshi, for that intervention and, and, and sharing with us. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we are at uh, the point where we are going to be taking a 15 minute minute coffee break. Um, in the during that time, we're going to have a fun interlude by Miss Keisha Codrington from Trinidad and Tobago. I am Keisha Codrington from Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to the Caribbean Telecommunications Union ICT Week 2021. Do enjoy. <laughs> 